with that, I think I know most of you on the call, but introduce myself. I'm Callie Cornell. I work with the Center for Collaborative Education in partnership with Jennifer Guatkin at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, and we just want to remind you that this uh, workshop will be recorded. And so, uh, as I just said, you'll be able to access it as well as colleagues afterwards on our technical assistance website. Uh, we do also want to let you know that live closed captioning is available if that's something that you'd like to utilize. So in the top, uh, it's usually in the top left hand corner of your Zoom screen, though Zoom has been doing some updates lately, so it might be take some searching to find. You should see a, a, um, a red live button sort of that has this otter uh, live notes marking on it. So if you click that down arrow and open that up, it'll open a, a browser window that will include the real-time closed captioning transcript that you can follow along with. Uh, and here's our team. Again, I am Callie Cornell and I'm joined by Jennifer Guatkin at the, the Department of Elementary and Education. Uh, Jennifer, you want to say good morning? And if there are any additional DESI folks who are joining, I don't think so, but want to give space if there are to introduce them. Awesome. Thank you, Kelly. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedules to be here today. I believe, at least at this point, I'm the only Desi person, but if anyone joins, um, I'll be sure to give them uh, a little acknowledgement. Um, thank you. Of course. Uh, and a few notes about our team. Uh, many of you know um, Don Shearer Corin and wanted to alert you that uh, Don has transitioned from CCE. We still wanted to recognize her contributions to today's workshop. She now has a position with Newton Public Schools and so excited for Newton, though uh, sad for CCE and for the Innovation Pathways work that Don is no longer working directly with us. Um, also, many of you know Laura Toda on our team. Laura is still on maternity leave, though we hope will be returning to us soon. Um, and then finally, Allison Plez and Allison, who is our behind the scenes tech guru. She is helping making sure today's webinar and workshop runs smoothly. And so if you have any tech issues along the way, once we take a look at small group discussions and, and other times throughout the webinar, sharing links, if you have any trouble with any of that, you can contact Allison directly to get some support behind the scenes. Um, and I think everybody here knows us, but just in case, uh, the Center for Collaborative Education um, is a nonprofit education support organization based out of Boston. Really, our mission is to work with schools, districts, and communities to increase voice and ownership, uh, equity, and opportunities for all, and particularly thinking about how we can reduce systemic racism and transform schools so that all students have the opportunities and the access to succeed. And so we are a proud partner uh, with DESI to support the technical assistance for the Innovation Pathways Partnership. Uh, and and we support both those who are part of the existing network of designees, as well as those who are in the process of seeking designation and in that pipeline. Um, and sort of like in addition to this today's workshop, we have a series that have happened throughout the year, and we have a few additional events for the remainder of the year that are workshops, program spotlights, uh, webinars, all around technical assistance and support um, for all of you within the network. Um, and today we're here specifically around sort of, uh, three topics, um, which are all uh, intricately connected, right, around student advising, recruitment, marketing, and family engagement. And so our intended outcomes for today's workshop are to give you some time and space to think about your individual school's strengths and areas of growth within each of those topics to understand and explore strategies and ideas um, on advising uh, and family engagement and recruitment within the network. Uh, we'll hear some from colleagues, we'll share some uh, strategies. And then finally, as is always an intended outcome, it's to build connections across the designee network. So giving you all time to connect with one another. Um, and so given those outcomes, here's our agenda for today. We're trying something a little bit different if you've been with us for workshops in the past. And so what we're, we have today are sort of essentially three mini lessons. So we'll have a sort of overview, our connections as we always do at the beginning, and then each of these topics, advising, marketing recruitment, and then family engagement, will have about 10 to 15 minutes of content and sharing. And then we'll give you some time to reflect with colleagues um, both on what you've just heard, sort of processing and reflecting on, on what was just within the mini lesson, mini presentation, and also a chance to share some individual strategies across schools. So for each of these, we'll have a, a, a few minutes of sort of 10 to 15 minutes of content, and then we'll jump into getting you some time to talk with one another. 
Um, and then that will bring us to the close. And I'm realizing here that uh, my timing is off. We're not until three o'clock today. We are only until 11 a.m. <laughs> my final one here. Um, but so we'll, we'll start as we are at nine o'clock and then we'll wrap up by 11 a.m. this morning. And uh, as we always like to do, want to learn a little bit more, hear a little bit more from each of you. And so um, if you haven't already, we invite you to add your name and your school district to the chat. And also sort of take a moment to think about this connections question here, which is uh, what person or what experience did you find most instrumental to your own decisions about what to do after high school? Uh, and so we'll ask you to share that in the chat. And then as a preview, I might ask one or two folks to share that with the group aloud. So I'll give you a moment there. Good morning to folks in the chat. I see Carrie and Anne Marie and Robert and Laura and Kevin, Jill. Good morning to everyone. I see lots of folks talking about parents guiding their decisions, love of education. Excellent. I'm wondering if anyone wants to come off of mute and share uh, that experience or those folks that were most influential to them. All right, hearing none, we'll move on. But I do hope that you are chatting a little bit more in your once we get to small groups and chat with one another. Uh, but totally fair that folks are a little bit hesitant. Maybe coffee hasn't kicked in quite yet uh, this morning. Um, so with that, we'll jump right in. So the first part of our conversation, I want to give you a chance to sort of just ground in the conversation that we'll have today. And so. Um, Many of you are very familiar with this list here on the screen. So these are our guiding principles as part of the Innovation Pathways Network, um, at, whereby equitable access really is around supporting students designing the program that prioritizes supporting underrepresented students, typically in enrollment and completion, and really thinking about having structures in place to eliminate barriers for student participation across the board guided academics to really provides a description of how programs are structured around really clear and detailed academic pathways in terms of your coursework or sequencing um, and experiences beyond the classroom. Um, student supports, uh, thinking about demonstrating sufficient wraparound services for students, um, and particularly thinking about both the ways that we can identify academic and non-academic supports for students within the pathway. Um, connection to career is number four. It really captures how programs are exposing students to targeted opportunities that are intended to lead to exposure within the field, within careers. Um, and so this target exposure comes um, from opportunities in workforce, career development skills, career counseling, work-based learning, sort of lots of other opportunities. And then finally, effective partnerships, where there's this requirement, but to, as you all are familiar, between a formal partnership between the school or the district, uh, mass hire your local uh, workforce development board along with one or more employers. And so, to, so today we'll really be focused on having some conversations around equitable access, student supports, and connection to career. So that's sort of like really where we'll focus in today. Um, and we want to give you a chance to do some self-reflection this morning. So we have something called the um, Innovation Pathways Site Self-Assessment Tool, which is a tool that provides a way for you as an individual or as part of your planning teams to sit down and really evaluate where you are within your practice. And it has these, as you see on the screen, these three categories sort of within each guiding principle. It's broken up by each of the five guiding principles. Um, and it talks about and shares examples around where you might be initiating practice and some indicators there, where there's emerging or developing practice, and finally where there's established or sustained practice. This is not meant to be evaluative in any way. It's really about your own self-assessment, providing where a realistic glance around where you are, around implementation, design of your pathway programs, and supports both those who are in the pipeline, who are still working towards planning it, um, their initial cohort of students, and those who are already designees who have been implementing pathway programs. And it's written and designed in a way that can support 
So um, the, this, the full site um, self-assessment tool is available to you, but today we're just going to focus on the three categories of equitable access, student supports, and connection to career. Uh, and in a moment, if she's not already, my colleague Allison will share a link to that modified self-assessment in the chat. So again, it's not the whole thing, just a few portions that we've, we've pulled out for the purposes of today's conversation. Um, and we want to give you a chance to just read through that. We'll give you about eight minutes to read through um, and would really love to give a chance for you to think about where you might fall within each of these three principles on that um, continuum of uh, initiating to emerging to sustained practice. Um, and then we will sort of come back together to think about um, where, what things are going well, what things um, are, er what places are areas of need. So those two guiding questions for today. So I'll put eight minutes on the clock. Uh, Allison has shared that link to the self-assessment tool in the chat. Um, and then feel free to turn your, your camera and your mic off if that feels more comfortable to you while you're reviewing. And we'll see you in a few minutes. All right, so we'll ask folks to come back together. Um, and wanted to, so we have these two questions here on the screen around what's going well, what are areas of need, and we're not going to ask that you share that with anyone else, but really as an, a personal reflection for you to think about as we move through today. And as we have the opportunity to connect with colleagues, thinking about what are the questions that you can to contribute to in terms of area of strength, and what are the places... Oh, that was our timer. And what are the places where you uh, are feeling you have some questions for colleagues? And so really being able to ground in that before we dive into our topics today. Um, and so with that, we'll jump into our first topic. And so uh, we had a few folks join a little bit late. Um, and uh, we just wanted to frame sort of how we'll break up today. So we have a series of sort of like three mini lessons, if you will, where we have about 10 to 15 minutes of content, and then we'll have some time in small groups to reflect, process before we jump into the next topic. Um, and so we'll start with our student advising piece. And so it's probably no surprise to anyone that we'll talk about a little bit about the requirements within Innovation Pathways for advising, and then talk a little bit about MICAP. And so within the pathways, as you're all well aware, um, it includes a requirement that you have well-designed college and career advising so that once students finish the pathway or once they come to the conclusion of their experience in high school, they have a really clear understanding of the post-secondary pathways and opportunities that are available to them after the sequence of experiences and courses that they had within the pathway. And in particular, um, the requirements around innovation pathways require that students have an individual plan. So as we all know, the MICAP uh, that's managed online. Uh, and so you, many of you use Naviance, um, MEPA Pathways, Career Cruising, or other systems to sort of manage the content that students uncover as part of the programming for, um, for MICAP for their individual learning plan. It also requires that there is career development education that are that's part of the advising process that includes the spectrum of learning from career awareness to career exploration to really thinking about immersion activities through work-based learning opportunities, internships, and, and other opportunities. Um, and then finally, that as part of this, there's really sort of awareness and access opportunities around college. Uh, career and post-secondary plans so that when students leave high school and they when they come to the conclusion of the pathway program, uh, they have a, a plan in place and have done some exploration on what make what are the right fits for them uh, over time. Um, and to just to, to take a look at it with a little bit more fine grain um, as part of the application process, some for some of you this has been a little while, so it's a good refresher. And for others of you, you are thick in it in the designation process at the moment, so this is very familiar to you. But sort of as we take a look at the Part A and Part B application requirements, specifically around advising, so sort of within Part A, there's a lot of things around sort of demonstrating that there is a career education exploration. I'm sorry, post secondary and career education exploration plan that's really grounded in employability skills and labor market information for your area and for this region in New England, um, that it includes places where students are familiar and are prepared to pursue next steps, um, that there's both academic and non-academic um, supports for students. So as challenges come that are unique to the Innovation Pathways program, to the content that they are participating in, that we have anticipated and that have plans of support for both academic and non-academic supports. 
um, that they, um, the MICAPS or begins in ninth grade and follows students through their experience in high school as part of the pathway and that you're using an online tool to support MICAP in both the career and the college and career counseling piece. So those are all within part one. As we head to part B, those get a little bit more fine grained, right? So there we have the ILPs have a connection to students' interests and exposure to career. We're getting a little bit more fine grained based on what we're learning about students, what students are learning about themselves, that there's advisory or other structures to support students that are built into the program. So there's dedicated time for student advising for taking a look at their MICAP and going through these exploration activities. Um, and, and really that you have policies in place for communicating with students when they are at risk and I'm sure when they have some additional supports and what will help them get back on track. Um, and then finally, as part of the Part B criteria, looking for evidence around post-secondary awareness activities that include application assistance, financial aid counseling, college and career advising to help students make a decision around what's next for them after high school. Of course, we know that often changes for students, but helping them sort of where they are make the most informed decision at that point in time. Uh, we have a bit more information around MICAP that we want to go through. For many of you, it's likely a refresher, but wanted to give that as a grounding before we head into some conversation and reflection with colleagues. So I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer to lead us through a few additional slides here. Thank you, Callie, and uh, feel free to advance. Oh, there you go. So good. Um, like Callie said, many of you are either um, in the MICAP trainings this year, probably wrapped it up already, or have done it in the past. Um, but with MICAP, uh, or My Career and Academic Plan, it's a student-driven, holistic, multi-year process that's intentional. It's designed to pro provide students with ongoing opportunities to plan for their academic, their personal, social, and their career success in high school, and beyond. And research supports the use of MICAP, which is uh, the artist formerly known as the Individual Learning Plan, is a tool to improve student engagement, attendance, goal setting, self-identification of strengths and weaknesses, and understanding of the connection between education and future aspirations, and choice and voice. Um, so Kelly, feel free to advance the slide. So MICAP is both a process and an instrument. Uh, as I've said, it's student directed. Uh, we want the whole school involved in this. Um, hence, if you've done the trainings, uh, you sent not just guidance counselors or school counselors, you sent someone from the administration, uh, you sent teachers, and it's intended to be implemented in a variety of settings. So not just in the guidance counselor's office, um, it could be uh, in classrooms and seminars, workshops, as well as individually. I know having just met with uh, so many of you who were going through the designation process this year, uh, we talked about your plans for making sure that MICAP was integrated. Uh, and probably most importantly, I think, is having a caring adult advocate. It could be really anyone at the school, counselor, teacher, administrator, paraprofessional, uh, any staff member um, being a, sort of a I don't know, a, a cheerleader for the student, someone the student knows that they can, they can go to and they can trust. Uh, and it's connecting the academic learning with, with students' future plans, um, sort of the goal of Innovation Pathways, right? Uh, to contextualize uh, and to give students links to what's gonna happen beyond high school. The instrument part, uh, Callie's talked about, uh, it's having uh, an online platform, uh, many of you use Naviance, MIFA Pathways, as a repository for um, the documents that um, the students are completing. Uh, it's uh, evidencing the students have um, have uh, checked off some of the learning objectives at each grade level. Um, it could be like an e-portfolio that captures the artifacts and the growth of learning. Uh, and it's really designed to, to be where the students' uh, interests, their goals, uh, any of the barriers that they might be facing, um, and then also action steps to surmount the barriers. Let me go to the next slide. Uh, so, MICAP is actually rooted in uh, the definition of college and career readiness that dates back to, I believe, 2016. Uh, it was blessed by both the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education and the Board of Higher Education via joint approval, uh, establishing readiness as the individual having the requisite skills, all knowledge, skills, and experience in the academic workplace readiness and personal social domains to successfully navigate to completion an economically viable career pathway in a 21st century economy and engage in active civic life. So workplace readiness, academic learning, personal and social development, all of that um, at the center, um, what I just talked about. 
So here is the college and career readiness framework, and this is intended to be for every grade, um, nine through 12. So the three domains being personal, social, career development, and academic and secondary planning. And so for every year, you would have learning objectives, implementation strategies and activities, and um, certainly the, the process and the documentation uh, via MICAP. And this is a sample, uh, the, the curricula actually for ninth grade. Um, again, you can see the domains, learning objectives, implementation strategies and activities, and then the MICAP documentation that we, um, we would expect uh, to be completed and to be documented. Excellent. Thanks, Thank Kelly. You. Again, I went through that really quickly because I know that it's familiar to you all. And uh, certainly if you have questions, um, feel free to reach out. Yeah, absolutely. And these slides will be available afterwards. We post them on the website. Um, so you'll have access to these. We also, um, as part, we'll share this link a little bit later, but we have a resource guide for everything that we shared today. And included in that is the MICAP implementation guide that's provided from Desi. And so the link to that will be available as well. Um, one of the things that we've heard from you all is that really valuable value the time to connect with colleagues. And so particularly because we've not been able to be in person for the last couple of years, having time and space, particularly on longer uh, workshops when we have these two hours together to have a little bit of time to connect with one another and just explore and talk within particular topics. And so that's what we've really designed today around. And so in a moment, we'll put you into some small groups, groups of like three or four folks will be in your group. Um, and Allison has shared within the chat um, the question guide. And um, so all of the questions for each of the breakout spaces we'll have today um, will be there. And so you'll be with a small number of colleagues to reflect on you know, what you've heard today, what you, what you have in place around student advising. And we offer some some guiding questions here. So you don't have to stick to these if the conversation goes somewhere else, but as a guide and thinking about how are you implementing MICAP and a student-driven course planning within innovation pathways? What does that look like for you? Um, and what does student advising look like prior to the pathway? So if your students into the pathway and once students are in the pathway, what do those sort of pieces look like? Um, and then sort of this larger question to be thinking about is when we think about aligning both horizontally and vertically across the pathway program. Um, what does that look like? How might we do that within a school? What does that look like for you as you're thinking about alignment across all of the innovation pathways activities and how that sort of plays into and, and integrates with student planning and advising over time within their high school experience? So those are your guiding questions. Uh, we'll have 10 minutes in the breakout spaces. So say hello, introduce yourself, and then jump into these um, into these questions and we'll come back together um, just at about 9.45. So we'll see you soon. Welcome back. Uh, we have a few other folks or quite a few of the other groups joining back in a moment. So we'll give them just about 30 seconds or so to come back. Three and four, they must be really engaged. Not saying the other rooms weren't, but. <laughs> You know, I just think it's a good sign when folks are like, wait till the very last minute where they're yeah. like, off mid sentence before coming back. <laughs> <laughs> they let time out on them. That's right. Room one also. Rooms five and two probably solved world peace <laughs> <laughs> during their conversations. Great. And I think everyone's back now. So welcome back everyone. We hope that um, you've had some good group discussions, got to meet some folks from other districts and other pathway programs. Um, a note uh, before we jump into sort of our next piece is that we will be keeping the same group. So as you head into our next conversation after we talk about uh, recruitment and marketing, you'll have a chance with those same folks to reconnect. And so uh, hoping you establish some good connections with the folks in your group. 
Um, and so we're excited to jump into the next topic here around recruitment and marketing. Um, and so we have a few things which are shared generally, but this is so personal to individual programs. It looks different in every place. And so for this section, we'll sort of talk through a few elements um, that we know sort of based on best practice and research are crucial to thinking about marketing and recruitment for high school students within pathway programs and other opportunities within school and within high schools. And then we'll also have a chance to hear from Kristen Elmquist, who's a colleague at the um, Dearborn Academy in Boston, to talk a little bit about uh, their recruitment opportunities and how they set up some of their recruitment, which they call Selection Day, and sort of some of the processes around that. So we'll get to hear an example from a school. Uh, but before we hear from Kristen, a few things for consideration in terms of pathway marketing and recruitment. Um, so we know from the research that building effective and consistent communications and relationships with students are crucial. And so thinking about if it's not to you individually, think about who has those relationships with students and can be communicating with students as early as possible about these opportunities so that they're able to come forward with questions. They're able to sort of talk about the pathway as part of opportunities as they head into high school, or if they're with you already in the ninth grade, as they head into making decisions about pathway either later in the year or in 10th grade. Um, and what we also know is that Many of us sort of plan all the activities, right? We have all the things to expose students in lots of different ways. So we do, um, you know, like open houses and on-site visits and presentations and all of these things. And what we, uh, what the research says is to, not to just have activities, but to have outcomes, have a purpose to each of those days that are really based on data and information about effective recruitment strategies for your students in your buildings and in your district. And so, yes, continue to have those activities. It says do not still have those activities. The slide says do not still have them, but really approach them not like a throw everything at the wall and see what sticks sort of strategy, but really thinking about what are the outcomes that are intended for each of those activities and how do you help streamline those communications, those marketing, those communication points within each of those activities. We also know um, that having talented and engaged staff, which you all have in your pathway programs, is your program's most precious resource. Like those Having those one-on-one -on -one conversations or those group conversations between teachers and staff as part of the pathway program with students can go a long way in helping ensure that students have the right exposure, right information, right decision points for that program. And so really utilizing your existing staff in conversation with students will make a world of a difference. There's also this piece around having students talk about their why. So like really engaging your um, youth, engaging students in talking about their program participation. And so at our, our last webinar, we had folks, we had a few different students from West Springfield High School talk about their experience and having opportunities like that for students to hear from one another, for adults in your building and in your community to hear from students around the impact that the program is having can pay dividends in exposing and garnering, garnering interest and in marketing around your programming. Um, we also know that having recruitment and retention plans in place that explicitly name and plan for some of the challenge you, challenges you have around marketing recruitment are crucial. So thinking, you all know the challenges that you have in your building, all know the barriers. And so thinking about how you build those plans from the beginning around recruitment and retention to plan for some of those things as best as possible. Of course, things always change and are always evolving. And like, who knew two years after the, you know, first COVID exposures, we'd still be in a mostly virtual environment and, and different places, um, but being able as best as possible to sort of plan for some of those things ahead of time. And then, of course, including counselors, including your guidance staff, um, they often tend to be sort of the gatekeepers of student opportunity. They tend to be a place where students go to for their course scheduling, for information, and so really ensuring that your counseling staff are on board or advocates for you for your innovation pathway programming and for opportunities for students. And so we sort of offer those as considerations um, based on the research. A lot of the points here are within a Youth for Youth report that was released last year um, around sort of marketing and recruitment of students within, a, within, the, within the COVID era. Um, and so sort of offer these as, as some pieces to think about as you're planning for your marketing and recruitment. 
And with that, I'm excited to turn it over to Kristen Umquist uh, to share a little bit about the Dearborn STEM Academy's uh, recruitment and marketing strategies. So Kristen is the Director of Early College and Career Pathways at Dearborn um, and really excited, Kristen, to hear from you today around the processes that you have in place for students. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kristen. Thanks, Callie. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Kristen Omquist. I'm the Director of Early College and Career Pathways at the Dearborn. Um, we're about three or four years into our Innovation Pathways work. Um, Callie, do you, are my slides in the deck? Yeah, awesome. Um, so as Callie had mentioned earlier, we call, we're a wall-to-wall -wall pathway school, meaning every 10th through 12th grader selects into a pathway. So it's it's a little easier for us to do a whole selection day, but I think the model that we have could actually work for any school that wants to expose grade levels to um, pathway recruitment. So we call it selection day. We just had our ninth grade selection day on Monday. It was awesome. Um, if you could hit the next slide for me. So just a little bit about Dearborn. Um, our name is Dearborn STEM Academy. It sounds really fancy. It's a fancy name for a regular open enrollment public school in Roxbury. Um, we're in Nubian Square, um, which basically means that any student in the city of Boston can put our school as one of the three choices that they choose into in high school. There's no application. There's no test. Um, so Typically, about 80% of our students just come generally from our neighborhood um, in a close distance. So we are a school that's focused on STEM and early college. Um, as I mentioned before, we're um, an IP school that's wall-to-wall -wall starting in 10th grade. We have three IP designations, uh, one in health science, one in computer science, and one in advanced manufacturing and engineering. Um, the students call it engineering because advanced manufacturing is something that they start to grasp once they're in it, and it's part of how we introduce it, but engineering is just a more accessible term for the students uh, when we talk about our pathways. And we also have an early college designation with Wentworth Institute of Technology, um, who helps um, give early college options for all three of our pathways. So this is just a visual. Um, I will say the number one thing to do anytime, and I think Callie hit upon this in her original um, presentation of, of good practices, is have students do the leading of your workshops as often as possible. So our seniors, which you can see pictured here, are in front of our ninth graders talking about, um, this happens to be the early college workshop. There were four workshops um, that we held. Early, the early college workshop was one of them. So these are early college students, one from each pathway that are standing up and talking about what their experience was. Um, they put together the presentation themselves with our help. So it highlights all the important things that um, about early college, their experiences in the pathway. Um, and they put together like a cahoot for the students. And they did a whole activity breaking down um, the different college options that students have in the school. It's, it was pretty amazing. Um, so number one rule is if you have students in your pathway, they are your best marketing tool. Um, if you can just hit the next slide. So as I mentioned, a selection day for us um, is a two hour block of time uh, where students, when they first start, um, they take a self-assessment that the teachers put together with a bunch of I, I statements, I like or I want. And students will check off the ones that they want. And then basically we have a system that spits out what pathway they're most closely aligned to based on their answers. This doesn't place them in a pathway. It just kind of gives them and highlights to them, based on your interests, you might really like being in the health science pathway. So like pay some extra attention in that workshop. Um, and then students are handed those the day before they enter their workshops. So they kind of have an idea. And then on selection day, they'll rotate through four workshops, each are a half hour. Obviously one in advanced manufacturing engineering, one in computer science, one in health science, and then the early college workshop. Um, each workshop is usually led by our seniors or our juniors, depending on the age of the pathway um, students that are selecting and their teachers. And both the students and the teachers co-plan the actual workshop that's gonna take place. I apologize for the bells. Um, after the experience is over, we, in lieu of lunch, buy all the students pizza. They stay in a classroom with one of the pathway teachers and they fill out an experience form. I linked it here. I think Callie can either share this presentation with you or share the link with you if you're at all interested. It's a Google form. Ask for all the information you would ever want from a child that you may not get from like an Aspen or <laughs> what your school has. I mean, we ask for cell phone numbers and parents numbers and all those things. 
which we then use um, for follow up. But on this form, students select and they do it on a sliding scale, which pathway they prefer. Um, and then there's also a few reflection questions on why it is that they think that they want that pathway. Is it what their assessment pre-assessment told them? Is it something that they um, are just excited about because they experience certain things in the workshop and it maybe it doesn't align to their self-assessment, but it has them do a little bit of reflecting and thinking before clicking and getting placed in the actual form. Um, or I'm sorry, pathway. And Callie, next slide. Try and keep it short for everybody. Um, oh, there was, oh yes, there it is. Um, so just in case you wanted a sample of like what our crazy schedule looks like, you can see that um, here, it's basically a two hour block with lunch afterwards. It tells you which room students will be in and like who's rotating through, but just get, we have, we're a small school. So if it's a 10th grade selection day, there are four sections of 10th grade. So we just split them up and in their cohorts, they follow this schedule. Um, and this is this is what selection day looks like for us. Um, why I think this would work even in a non-pathway school is that you are advertising a program to students in certain grade levels. So I would say if you're a school that offers one or two pathways, ask your school, ask your administration to support the program and allow you to do some sort of experience that all students cycle through. Um, and why that's important is the kids then have a common experience about what your program is about. Hopefully it's interacting with students in that program to see it's not just adults pitching this thing that they hope students would want to do. Um, and I think it would definitely increase enrollment in programs if you do kind of think through a way to have all of your, your students cycle through the experience. Um, and then as a side note, you know, when, with regard to outside our websites under construction, but we do have a pathways website, um, that does include everything from early college opportunities to the programs that we have and, and what they do in those programs, um, and how they're aligned to other opportunities in work-based learning and things like that. So that can sometimes be your best friend is just having a place that holds your information that you can point families to that you can point, um, students to. And I'm gonna stop talking now because I feel like I've talked for a while. Um, I will put my email in the chat in case anyone has any questions or needs more materials. I didn't wanna give you too, too much, um, but I'm happy to talk to anyone about recruitment or anything else pathways um, that you might need. Excellent, Kristen, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And sort of a note around um, uh, students and sort of like using students as a, a voice of the program for those who are sort of like is, is still in the designation process or don't yet have a formalized pathway that has officially started yet oftentimes there's an existing elective class or sort of something that happens already that is connected within the school of course it's already there that is connected to the pathway and the course sequence that you'll have as part of the formal pathway and sort of utilizing students who have gone through that elective to be able to talk about their experiences another way if you've not yet, if they can't yet say like, oh, I'm in this pathway, but they can speak to a particular course and experiences with a course, that's another way where you can draw some experience from students to talk about some sort of enticing pieces of the pathway experience. Um, so thanks so much. And we're going to give you all a chance now to get back into your small groups and have some discussion. There are a lot of questions here. And again, Allison will share in the chat our guiding questions guides. You have, you don't, you know, you don't have to take a screenshot or jot these down. You'll have that, the link to that guide to keep up on your screen as you head into small groups. Um, we'll give you about 10 to 12 minutes here we'll sort of um because there's a lot to cover uh and but really thinking about how you share or share with one another about how you reach students who are traditionally less engaged or haven't had access to opportunities to pathways or what are some of the entry points within your particular setting or within your con school context that help support that um, thinking about how you cultivate and demonstrate a sense of belonging within the pathway for students or really thinking about how students can see themselves in the pathway. So in Kristen's example, so sort of having really playing, you know, up and sort of sharing the importance of having other students, so having their 12th graders talk to their ninth graders um, about these experiences so that students can see themselves and their peers in these pathways. So what are some other opportunities that you have for that creating and cultivating that sense of belonging? 
Um, how do you or how will you uh, and how your staff engage with um, students, adult caregivers, their families and parents um, around some of these opportunities? We'll have a little bit more time to talk about this as part of the family engagement, our final section of the workshop. Uh, but sort of starting to think about that now and particularly giving information with to families ahead of student selection for pathway opportunities and keeping uh, families and parents informed about them. And then the final question here is, um, how are uh, sort of these enhanced student supports that we talked about as under the advising and my cap section part of sort of marketing for the program so rather than sort of framing them as an add-on when students are, you know aren't capable or, or sort of not that they're not capable but that they're not on track yet um and sort of like how to get them in a place where they feel capable that they feel empowered to make decision and have support ahead of the program to say like i am able to do these college level courses i am able to do hard things i am able to enter this even if i don't know what that looks like yet i know that there are supports in place to help support me there so thinking about all of those things within your own context um, you know, have a conversation with, they'll be in those same groups of colleagues that you met with for the first time. Uh, so say hello again, and then jump into these conversations. And again, these are just some questions to consider if the conversation takes you somewhere else within the topic of recruitment um, That's and marketing, that's great. Uh, so we'll give you um, about 10 to 12 minutes, and then we'll call you back for our final section around family engagement. We'll see you soon. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, hope that you had good conversation. Um, I think some folks were going to the very last second before the rooms kicked you back to the main room. Uh, and so hoping that you were able to sort of close up those conversations. We'll have one more opportunity to get back with those groups after our final section around family engagement. And so uh, you'll get a chance to connect one more time with, with your small groups. Um, and so jumping right in, uh, sharing some information around family engagement. And so um, we know that, a, and, and research has shown that a crucial part of supporting students is ensuring that there's there's an appropriate family engagement and family connection for not just your pathway programs, but sort of anything happening within, within the school and a connection point for parents. So we wanted to sort of start with sharing this particular graphic from um, TNTP, formerly known as the New Teacher Project. Um, and so they had a report released last year uh, around the five essentials for engaging families and community partners in decision making. Um, and so talked about sort of these elements around, you know, starting with reaching out, coming with a listening ear, assessing the needs of the community and of students, being able to plan together in authentic ways with families and community partners before you could even get to what they're calling true engagement. And so this is a, it's sort of like a long-term goal uh, and not something that happens after just one activity or sort of one interaction, but really an approach to interacting um, with students, with families, with community partners to get to sort of sustained engagement over time. So we sort of start with that framing uh, around the next couple of slides that we have to share. Um, there's also a report uh, earlier this year that just recently came out from the Brookings Institute talking about family engagement, particularly in the time of COVID and sort of how it's changed a lot of how we think about traditional family engagement. Um, and so out of this report, what they are sharing around authentic family engagement is that really it needs to be something that first and foremost is leaned into, that this family school collaboration is something that needs to be planned for and needs to be built into sort of your scheduling um, and as part of your day for the initiatives that you lead for these pathway programs. Um, and that sort of not just like wait and, and hope things return to normal, but really being proactive in the ways that the school is reaching out to families and the school is collaborating with families. The second piece that came out of the Brookings Institute report is that um, teachers and school leaders and staff all need training um, on engaging with, with families and students. And so oftentimes there can be a sort of blaming of like, oh, they don't do this, or oh, they, you know, our staff don't do that. But really thinking about how do we train people to be prepared, um, to know what kinds of interactions families are looking for, um, to know if there needs to be translation services or other opportunities in order to be able to involve parents um, and families within the school. And so really thinking about what are the, the training opportunities, both formal and informal, that need to happen around the pathways 
to, to support that engagement. Um, another piece is around bringing schools to families, not just the family into school. I think oftentimes our default, the easiest thing to do is open up the doors and invite families into the school, both physically, but also in a virtual space and things like Zoom and, and Google Meets and other online platforms. Um, and particularly what we know from the research and what's come out of this, and particularly noted in this Brookings report is that, um, for many reasons, families feel reluctant to engage with schools. And so schools must go out to where families are, both in a physical space and community centers and others, but also in online spaces. So in Facebook groups um, and in online communities and thinking about where parents are in terms of their social media and meeting them sort of where they are um, so that it's not just uh, families coming into the schools and responsibility of the family, but also schools and school staff that are being able to meet families both physically and sort of like in a virtual space where they are um, outside of the school buildings. Um, and so we'll also, we'll talk about this in a bit more detail in just a moment on the next slide, but really thinking about building trust by engaging parents versus involving them and sort of there's the, there's a, um, uh, a way that the Institute sort of talks about this difference between engaging versus involving. And really what we're hoping for is deeper level engagement versus involving parents, which sort of take on a few different tones. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail on the next slide. And then finally, to really planning for conversations, intentional conversations with families, with community partners, with parents around what makes, in their reported outlines, good education. But here I would say within innovation pathways, what are the impacts of the pathways? What are the, the, the places where the pathway is adding value to a student's education? What elements are really grounded in preparing them for post-secondary success and making time for those intentional and explicit conversations to happen in both group settings and online settings that vary variety of settings, um, but where that message is continually shared um, and, and supported and conversations happen with parents and families. Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, so the, there's this distinction that's being made um, in a lot of the research around family involvement versus family engagement. I thought this was a nice or fairly simplified graphic around the difference, right? And so really thinking about family involvement as something where there's a plan, you know, an example is like a plan is already in place and it's telling people, keeping people informed. And so family involvement also is generally around informing, whereas family engagement is really around co-creating gaining partnerships. And so it talks about sort of in these two differences and thinking about family involvement so really talking about talking to families. We're, we're all guilty of that, right? We, we talk to them versus engaging with them in conversation, really telling them like, well, there's this plan in place and here's how you can contribute and sort of having a list of sort of predetermined ways for families to contribute or come into conversations and really thinking about um, it's sort of this like goal of serving the community versus gaining partners, right? It's sort of this like item on a to-do list to check versus gaining partnerships. And so the way that the Institute and other researchers are thinking about family engagement is around being able to, to um, cultivate opportunities where you're coming with a with a um, intent to listen to, to parents and families um, and that you're gaining partnerships really to gain some advocates that can help support larger conversations across the community. And this take work, it takes time. It doesn't happen in just one or two or even three conversations, but really a sustained effort over time. Uh, so one more slide to share around some family engagement um, and some sort of just considerations and things to, to be thinking about. And so we know that um, multiple and varied engagement strategies are required when communicating with partners outside of the school, including families. And so this graphic that's here is a little bit hard to see on the screen, but it sort of gives a whole host of ways um, that the engagements are happening. So they might be happening on social media, they might be happening in terms of flyers or town halls or, you know, um, uh, virtual events. So like having lots of opportunities for families to um, connect into uh, some of the work happening. Um, and so rather than just saying like, well, we held, we held an open house for families and, you know, we got mediocre interest or, or people to show up, really having these different opportunities for folks to come and engage um, in a multiple different varieties. And within those engagements, really ensuring to use asset-based perspective and language, what are families uh, bringing and what are students bringing that are assets to the pathway and sort of starting from a place um, and starting those conversations and continuing those conversations with asset-based language and perspective. 
Um, another consideration is on translation. Oftentimes, um, translation is important. It's a barrier for many families for involvement, but it doesn't signal engagement. So by just translating some of the materials you have into uh, a mother language, um, it's sort of what we say is like not quite sufficient enough. Like it is a barrier and it's something we need to think about um, breaking down for families, uh, but it gets us to perhaps, you know, information or involvement, but not necessarily engagement with families. Um, we also want to think about sort of the sense of efficacy or, or sense of belonging that parents feel. We sort of talked about that in the previous slides a moment ago around um, families for um, uh, either their own lived experience or cultural experiences and norms around uh, school districts and coming into schools or really making sure that there's a sense of belonging for parents um, and also honoring the sense that they're an expert in their child. And so thinking about the experiences and, and what they bring to conversations around being an expert on their child and their child's needs. So two final points and considerations for family engagement, uh, really sort of emphasizing in conversations um, with parents um, sort of, uh, the pathway impact. So any time possible, so thinking about the impact the, uh, and the um, benefits of the pathway so that parents can begin to be cultivating as leaders within the family, with the, within the community, so they can continue to be your advocates over time within, within the community and for the pathway program. So there's a lot of information, a lot of considerations. And so I'm gonna give you a, more time to sort of process that. And so for the final time today, we are going to head into small breakout groups um, before we come back to sort of do some final pieces and, and some thinking about next steps. Um, so in small groups, uh, and I apologize, we have another edit on the slide that says advising, but it should say family engagement, um, but consider um, how communication with families or promotes asset perspectives, student potential, and success within your context, and share specific examples if you have those or can think of those. Um, and then after hearing sort of the information on the last couple of slides, who are you thinking differently about family involvement versus family engagement? What's coming up for you? How are you processing that? So Allison um, has shared in the chat the guiding questions document. It's the same document we've been sharing for each breakout space, but just so that you have that handy, you have these questions. Um, we'll give you 10 minutes and we'll come back together for our final closing pieces. Thanks so much. So we have a few, so there's a few final minutes around upcoming events and reminders. We'll actually be able to jump off a little bit early today, give you some, hopefully some much needed, a uh, little bit of time back before your next meetings and commitments this afternoon, um, but wanted to run through a few additional pieces before the end of our time together. So as always, we wanted to remind you that the Innovation Pathways Technical Assistance website and toolkit are always available to you. Many of the resources we referenced or talked about today are part of the Innovation Pathways toolkit, and it's really designed um, to provide you with tools, processes, resources, um, though not exhaustive, sort of to help you in your design and implementation and development of uh, your pathway programs. And so a lot of information within the toolkit, certainly not meant to um, sort of have everything of use, but really designed in a way that can help you um, sort of customize based on your implementation needs and the needs of your teams and your pathway programs to find things that you need along the way. And that is available on our technical assistance website, which is that link at the bottom of the screen um, that I believe that Allison has also shared directly within the chat. Uh, we also have some exciting news to share around a network um, uh, contact list. And so many of you have asked, is there a way for us to get in touch with other folks within, um, within the Pathway network? And so if you have connected with peers today or through other webinars or workshops that you'd like to get in touch with, um, we have this running Google sheet that has the Innovation Pathways network contact list. It includes people's names, their schools, um, their role and their email address so that you're able to find folks and get in touch in between any of these sessions. Um, so again, Allison has shared that link in the chat. We'll also have it available on our technical assistance website, as well as the resource guide that we share with you all from today. Um, and so speaking of, if Allison, if you've not shared the resource list, all of the resources we talked about today were shared in a resource guide for today. And so you can head back and so that you don't have to save all of these links individually, they're all shared there within that one document. And that will be posted as part of our workshop materials uh, on the website afterwards. Um, but so this is exciting. People have been asking for this for a little bit of time. And so um, you should be able to 
find people's information here. This is an opt out list. And so um, as folks register for events, their email and addresses, you'll, you should see at the bottom of registrations, a sort of opt in, opt out checkbox. Um, and so if you see your name on the list and you don't want your name on the list, feel free to email us, we'll take it off. Um, but so that you should find most people's information here. Um, a few notes around upcoming events. Uh, we had on our calendar an April 12th webinar, um, though the, because of scheduling and some conflicting, conflicting things happening, um, we're still uh, to be determined on that webinar. So look for information for us in the coming week. April 12th is not that far away. It's only a couple weeks away, um, which means uh, April vacation is not that far away for many of you. Um, but so keep an eye out for it from us around either a topic or a cancellation for that particular webinar. We'll let you know soon. Um, we also have on May 11th, for those who are in the designation process um, that have received news around designation uh, webinar, you're a designee, now what? And so really thinking about what are some of the things that should be top of mind and supporting once you've received news of, of confirmed designation, helping you think about what comes next in order to prepare for student enrollment in the fall. And then finally, if you um, or others, you know of other schools or districts that are interested in becoming an Innovation Pathway designee, we have a workshop on June 2nd, specifically for those who are looking at adding pathways um, or new designees to the process to, to run through all of the requirements and all of the pieces around apl the application process. We have our Innovation Pathways FAQ guide. Um, uh, there's a direct link here, that tiny URL, but it's also available at our uh, technical assistance website. You can register for any of these events. You can also take a look at the FAQ guide. Lots of information. We're continuing to add to it all the time based on the questions um, that we're hearing from all of you throughout the year. Uh, and then finally, we asked you to complete a, a survey for today. We take a look at the surveys each time and really want to know about your experience in the workshop, what worked for you, what didn't, what, what outcomes are you leaving with that you feel good about. Um, and the survey should take you literally no more than a minute to complete. And so we ask you to open this link. Uh, Allison has shared it in the chat. Um, and if you're not able to complete it right now, if you could open that browser, keep it open until you're able to complete it at some point today. Um, but we really do take a look at each and every one of the responses and use those responses to uh, inform our next set of technical, assist event, technical assistance events, excuse me. Um, and so we appreciate you taking the time to fill out that brief survey. And then with that, Jennifer, any closing remarks or, or anything to say as we close out our day today? I just wanted to add for those of you who are interested in seeking a designation for another pathway, I believe that everyone who's here who's connected with the school as a current designee or is um, in the pipeline for this year. Uh, I will be updating the DESI Innovation Pathway site with the timeline for the next designation cycle. Uh, there will be a planning grant opportunity that will post in April. Those materials will be due at the end of June. Uh, dollars will be released uh, in July. That's to help you with the preparation of the materials for Part A, which will be due in October. So a very similar timeline to what you see currently posted for this year. Um, again, I'll be updating that in the coming weeks. So thank you all for being here today. Excellent. Thank you. And echoing Jennifer, thank you so much for spending a morning with us. We hope today was helpful and insightful and gave you a chance to gain new information and connect with colleagues. Um, and as always, please feel free to be in touch with questions in between. You don't need to wait for sessions to be in touch with us. Jennifer and I are always available to you, uh, and we look forward to seeing you at upcoming events. Um, thanks so much, everyone. If we don't see you, have a great April break. Happy spring, um, and we look forward to connecting you, connecting with you before the end of the year. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day.